Hello, you are watching the Keto Diet Podcast. My name is Leanne Vogel. I blog over at healthfulpursuit.com and I'm also the best-selling author of The Keto Diet, The Keto Diet Cookbook, and Keto for Women. And we have an awesome show set up for you today. Uh, Gary Taubes is coming on the show. An award-winning science and health journalist is co-founder and director of the Nutrition Science Initiative. He is the author of The Case Against Sugar, Why We Get Fat, and Good Calories, Bad Calories, and the former staff writer for Discover and a correspondent for Science. He has written three cover articles on nutrition and health in the New York Times Magazine, and his writing has also appeared in The Atlantic, Esquire, and numerous best of anthologies, including the best of the best American science writing, 2010. He has received three Science in Society journalism awards from the National Association of Science Writers, and also is the recipient of a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Investigator Award in Health Policy Research. He lives in Oakland, California, and is a really co cool human. His book has just recently come out. It's called The Case for Keto. I will include links to The Case for Keto and a bunch of other books that he's written. I've read almost all of his books, and I actually did a review for Good Calories, Bad Calories, which you can watch up here or down below. So today we really, as the title suggests, we're talking about obesity and the story behind obesity, the ketogenic diet, calories, hormones, uh, the misconceptions of science and where we went wrong with all of the nutrition stuff. So if you struggle with your weight or you know somebody who feels like they're doing everything right but nothing is working, today's episode is going to be really powerful for them to really be validated in all the feelings that they're having and the struggles that they're having. So I can't wait to share this interview with you. Before I do, I just want to let you know that we have two awesome sponsors for today's podcast. The first is Element. They make delicious electrolyte powders. Um, I really love the unflavored version, but they have all sorts of flavors, they're delicious. And as you know, electrolytes are so important on your ketogenic diet, especially if you're fasting. So I'll include a link down below with a savings code. And my friends at Bel Campo are sponsoring this show. Also, they make delicious, delicious meats. I eat at least one of their steaks a week and I'm always so impressed with the quality. Grass-fed, grass-finished, super rich in nutrients as opposed to grain-fed cattle. They're organic. Oh, their practices around farming just get me so excited. So I will include a link down below for Belcampo and a savings code if that interests you. And as always, if you have a question for me or you want to see something on the Keto Diet Podcast, you can reach out to me go by going to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact. I'll include a link down below and in the corners for that. So without further ado, let's get over to this interview. Hi, Gary. How's it going? Hi, Leanne. It's great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm so glad to have you on. I've read all your books. Uh, I'm hoping uh, that many of our listeners have read at least one of your books. You have so many, and I'm just um, <laughs> excited to pick your brain. Okay, well, let's go. Pick away. Yes. <laughs> pick away. Um, so, okay, you started writing about sugar and then fat and then calories, now keto. Tell us a little bit about the case for keto and, and why you wrote it. Okay, there's a short story and a long story. Um, the short story is I have a friend in the science writing world who said, Gary, you have to write food rules. Gary's food rules, okay? People have read your books. They just want to know how to eat. This is a book you want to write. It should take you three weeks. I could write it for you in three weeks, she told me. She's a wonderful science journalist who has type 1 diabetes. So she knows of what she speaks. And I said, that's a really interesting idea. You know, I'm not adverse to a easy book and that will sell very well. And so I pitched it to my agent who liked it and they pitched it to my editor and they said, we'll give you an advance to write this book. And then I decided that I didn't want to write Gary's Food Rules because I don't actually like, weirdly enough, giving diet advice. Um, and certainly not simple 
food rules because the world is full of very good books now, including yours, that kind of teach people how to eat low carb, high fat ketogenic diets. I thought what the world needed at this point was, and what I wanted, what I needed, I wanted to know where we stood in this sort of dietary revolution that we've been trying to wage with the establishment. And I wanted to know what challenges faced the physicians who have transitioned into thinking the way we did. So when I first wrote about ketogenic diets for the New York Times Magazine back in 2002, I figured there were about a dozen physicians in the entire in the country, in the U.S. and maybe in the world, who were prescribing these diets to their patients. And then they would prescribe them to their patients, and their patients would go up and see other doctors who would say, oh, you're killing yourself, stop eating like that. And half of these physicians had written diet books, and today there's my estimate, roughly at least a few tens of thousands. And they had all converted to our way of thinking. And I wanted to know how they thought and what the challenges were. And then I wanted to sort of, there's so many misconceptions about how to think about this, that I wanted to write a book that kind of taught people how to think about approaching the metabolic disorders that are obesity and diabetes by changing how they eat. And so the original title of the book, and well, my original title was called in, fat of, in Praise of Fad Diets. And I knew my editor wouldn't go for that. Um, and then for a very long time, it was called How to Think About How to Eat. And then we learned that a month before the book was originally supposed to come out, which was a month after COVID hit, um, there was a book coming out by two sort of conventional wisdom advocates called How to Eat. So we had to get rid of how to think about how to eat, and then it became the case for keto. That's amazing to kind of see the progression of titles. I feel like almost all books do that. You know, you start off with one template and it ends up being sometimes, in your case, a completely different book. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, yeah, and it's just, um, Again, I think there's so many wonderful guides to eating keto, but the problem is that people think of it as, first of all, they think of it as it's still considered kind of a fad diet. So if I'm going to do this fad diet, this is how I'm going to learn how to eat, even though the people who write these books like yourself say this isn't a diet, it's a lifestyle. And then I think the medical community needs to understand why we're so sold on this. You know, I think of myself as a journalist and I say in the book that this is journalism. And, you know, I get pigeonholed because I'm from now promoting a dietary approach to, a, you know, way to eat. So that's what diet book doctors do. So now I'm a diet book doctor because I'm a promoting a diet. But the question is, why am I doing it if I think I'm a journalist? And the reason is because I find the evidence very compelling that this is how people who are overweight, obese, and diabetic should be eating if they want to fix those problems. Did you, did you write this book specifically for the medical community? Do you feel like the medical com community would benefit from reading your book? Or is it more for just the everyday human that really wants to understand? You know, it's uh, both. Um, I mean, I want to get to, we'd all like to get to everyone who has struggles with their weight and their blood sugar control and their blood pressure control. So these are the sort of the trio, obesity, diabetes, hypertension. Um, you know, the message, what I learned doing my journalistic investigations is that the conventional thinking on these disorders is wrong clearly wrong and that mistakes had been made and I got a lot of credibility from writing books explaining what those mistakes were even though they haven't been corrected and people have to get the right advice if they're going to try and fix these disorders through diet by changing what they're eating and they have to get the right advice clearly or it's not going to work so I want to reach the patient the individual but if you reach them and their doctor 
still thinks the conventional wisdom is the only way to go. We should all be eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, you know, low fat fish and lean meat in moderation, then you need, you can't do this if your physician is telling you you're killing yourself. It's almost too hard of a challenge to get over. Some of us have, and then we just don't go to the doctors anymore, which is probably not, I don't know, may or may not be a good thing. Um, so I'm writing it for the physicians also. I want patients to be able to give the book to their physicians and say, look, just, I'm begging you, read this, you know? So you understand why there are, you've got tens of thousands of fellow physicians out there who think this is the correct way to eat and why I'm doing it and why I think it's healthy and why I think you should support me in it. And, you know, it's an entirely different phenomenon when you do it on your own and when your physician either supports you with it or your physician is the one who broaches it to you, who says, you know, I think we've been doing this the wrong way. So let's try doing it this way. Because I think if you, instead of restricting fat and calories, you restrict carbohydrates, starches, grains, and sugars, I think we can make you healthy. And I think you'll, happy, you'll be so happy being healthy that you won't miss these foods. So, What was everyone. that moment like for you? Like, did you, were you always for fat? Did you always believe like, this is the way to eat? Or was there this moment for you and maybe doing your investigations where you're like, wait, we're doing all of this wrong. Like, what was that story for you? Uh, and that is another long story. I spent, I, can, I mentioned when we were chatting before we began that uh, my, I had a very health conscious mother. Okay, so she raised us in the 60s and 70s with, you know, healthy diets and the, every meal had, you know, green vegetables and starch and, uh, you know, protein, fat, uh, animal product thing. And, and um, you know, I'm, but I was a large, I'm a large guy. I played football in high school and college. I wasn't very good, but I played. I did my heaviest. I weighed 240 pounds. I was a defensive lineman. So people like me get heavier as we get older. We don't get lighter. And uh, through my, you know, I hit 30 and I started gaining weight. And I was living in California. I was living in Los Angeles and Venice Beach by the beach, which is a very sort of new agey place to live. And I was eating a very low fat, mostly plant diet because that's what we consider the healthiest diet in the 1990s. And I was gaining two pounds of fat a year. And I thought, as we all do, that this is sort of my fate. You know, you hear you'll turn 30, your metabolism slows down, you start to gain weight, and that's exactly what happened to me. Um, the uh, Meanwhile, I started doing these investments. My first two books were about bad science, about researchers, physicists who discovered, made mistakes, discovered non-existent phenomena. And I was obsessed with good science and bad science. and. In the 1990s, I moved into writing about public health issues because the science there was very shaky at best. And then by the late 90s, I moved into diet and nutrition. I kind of stumbled serendipitously into this field. And I did a long investigation for the journal Science on whether salt causes high blood pressure. And it turns out there's a very vitriolic debate about this that's been going on for decades, despite the universal belief by physicians that you put people on low salt diets. And the evidence is just terrible. So, and the scientists were, I, you know, I had learned how to do science from some of the best scientists in the world doing my first book. And then my second book was called Bad Science, which was about some of the worst scientists in the world, but I was getting mentored by these excellent scientists. And then I move into nutrition and these people are clearly terrible. Like they just don't really have a clue what it's all about. What do you have, how meticulous and rigorous you have to be to, to, um, uh, to get reliable knowledge in any scientific endeavor. So my second investigation was on dietary fat and heart disease. 
And this was done again for the journal Science. It won major journalism awards, science journalism awards. It was, I spent a year on a single magazine article that paid me for a month and a half. Um, the, uh, not that I'm bitter at being a journalist. <laughs> not at all. Um, <laughs> the, I interviewed, I think, over 140 researchers and you know public health administrators for a single magazine article and it convinced me that the dogma that i've been living on from the 1990s um through the 1990s that we should all be eating a low-fat diet was wrong i didn't know what we should be eating but i knew that i had been a sucker not eating an avocado for 10 years or peanut butter for 10 years, let alone I hadn't had a piece of red meat since like the 80s. Um, so I knew all that was wrong, but I didn't know what the right thing was. And while I was doing that story, um, again, the life of a freelance journalist, you do more than one story at once if you want to keep your income coming in. So I was also reporting a story on the economics of the stock market for um, uh, the, uh, the sort of science of the stock, mathematics of the stock market for Discover magazine. I was up at MIT interviewing a, um, an economist at MIT and I started telling him about the dietary fat story. And he said, oh, if you're writing about dietary fat, you have to try Atkins. And he said his collaborator Warden's father had lost 200 pounds on Atkins. So he tried it. He's Asian American and he had lost 40 pounds, basically giving up white rice. So I went back to Los Angeles. And I, you know, my parents were gone by now. I wasn't married. I didn't have children. I thought nobody cares if I give myself a heart attack. Uh, maybe my editor, but I doubt it. Um, so I could eat Atkins. And I did as an experiment. I had eggs and bacon and sausage for breakfast with like tomato slices. And lunch was, you know, a roast chicken or a piece of meat with green vegetables or a green salad. And dinner was roast chicken or a piece of meat or fish with green vegetables. And um, it's like I lost 25 pounds effortlessly. I mean, it's the fascinating experience. And I keep trying to explain this to all those researchers who say, well, you eat less on this diet. People like me, maybe people like, we spend our whole lives trying to keep our weight down, balancing how little we could eat against how hungry we are. And if we're large people like I am, we have large appetites. Um, and then suddenly you're eating what seems like large portions of food, you know, four scrambled eggs made with cream and butter and three pieces of bacon, three sausages for breakfast seems like a lot of food, still does. And you're losing weight effortlessly. And I talk about this in the book because at the time, for years afterwards, I would describe it as though a switch had been flicked. You know, I had flipped the switch from fat storage to suddenly I'm just like walking down the street and pounds of fat are dropping off behind you. It's, I stopped exercising because, well, I stopped doing aerobic exercise because I had been doing that just to burn calories so I could eat without having to starve myself. And now I could eat anyway. So this was all 2000. I actually fell off the diet, started eating desserts, which may have been some weird physiological response. And then I started doing this piece for the New York Times Magazine that was originally pitched as, um, let's figure out what started the uh, obesity epidemic. At the time, the awareness of the obesity epidemic was about four years. And so um, you could write an article about what might have triggered it. And my hypotheses were the introduction of high fructose corn syrup, which people like Michael Pollan were saying was what did it, or the transition to this idea that a low-fat diet was a healthy diet. Because when the government did that late 1970s, early 1980s, um, they turned, they, it used to be the idea was carbohydrates are fattening, and now suddenly carbohydrates became hard, healthy diet foods, and we were supposed to avoid fat, and that's what we did. And as I was doing that research, I came upon all these people who were testing 
the Atkins diet at Duke University and at Temple University and so the VA in Philadelphia and, and I think it was SUNY Downstate and Long Island and Harvard and they were all finding the same thing, which was it was a remarkable way to achieve weight loss and weight control without being hungry. And so I went back on it while I was doing that article because it worked and I've stayed on it ever since. Um, you know, it's uh, classic. I talk about this in the case for keto. People always, in order to buy into this, it's almost like you have to be converted yourself into a different way of thinking. And the way that happens for most of us is we're getting heavier or we're getting diabetic and we try the conventional way and it doesn't rule, you know, many of the physicians I interviewed for the book had spent time as vegetarians and even vegans. Many of them were world-class athletes. So they knew that it wasn't that they weren't working out enough. And then you abstain from starches, grains, and sugars, and the weight goes away, and your blood sugar comes under control, and your blood pressure comes down, and you feel healthy. So you say, you know, you'd almost be a fool not to want to keep it up. Yeah, completely. And where do you feel, like you mentioned high fructose corn syrup, and a couple of other things. Do you feel like that's where things went wrong when it came to um, the misconceptions around obesity? Or was it the calories? Or is it kind of a mishmash of things? Because if one is obese, they'll go to their doctor and their doctor will say, just eat less. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't work. So what happened? Like, why do we continue to tell people um, to eat less? And where is this coming from? And why, why are this, these misconceptions continued to be um, shared? Yeah, and I mean, this is when I mentioned that the nutritionists and obesity researchers were doing bad science. Um, it's kind of awkward because as far as I can tell, the mistakes are now about 100 years old. So there's a whole series of things. You know, the science is, the idea is hypothesis and test. And some people think of science as institutionalized skepticism. So a line I quote in many to most of my books is from the Nobel Prize winning physicist, Richard Feynman, who said the first principle of science is you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. And so the idea is you get these hypotheses and then you rigorously try to prove that your hypotheses are wrong because you're so likely to be fooling yourself that you're going to do experiments to show you how you're fooling yourself. And you keep doing the experiments until eventually you just can't face, you have to face up to the reality that maybe you're right. And then you publish the paper and you wait for all your colleagues in the scientific community to explain to you how you screwed up. And in obesity, they just didn't do any of that. They'd get these ideas. So the first idea is you get fat because you eat too much. Okay, so on one level, it seems kind of intuitively obvious. You got characters in the literature like Falstaff and Shakespeare, who's, you know, big, fat, gluttonous guy who loves to eat and drink. And, you know, one of the characters says he's eating her out of house and home. And so you go, here's a Falstaff, he's obese, he's a glutton, therefore gluttony causes the, causes the obesity. On the other hand, there was always this idea that people who are obese, who suffer from obesity, are just built differently than thin people. You know, their bodies want to accumulate excess fat and the bodies of thin people do not. And if that's the case, that accumulation of excess fat is a hormonal phenomenon. So just like some people's bodies want to be tall and some people's bodies don't and some of us are taller than others, some people's bodies want to be fat and other people's bodies don't want to accumulate fat. And some people are fatter than others, some people are hairier than others, some people are, you know, these are all hormonal phenomena regulated by hormones. And so if you're driven to obesity and it's, you know, a, a hormonal phenomenon, there's nothing really you can do about it one exception. 
but starving yourself isn't going to stop it any more than starving a growing child is going to stop that child from growing. You might stunt his growth for a while and you'll make him very hungry. You might have him exhausted and give him vitamin deficiencies and all this, but his body is trying to grow. And the, the, same, the, the hypothesis was this is the same for obesity. And what I found out doing the research, this is why the history of this field is so important. Uh, it wasn't until late 1930s that real research could be done on obesity because you couldn't really test it on humans. Um, you couldn't create obesity in humans and see what would happen. Um, they were already doing diet research and already clear that low carbohydrate diets had something unique about them that allowed people to lose weight. People were publishing on that. But once they start, they needed animals, models of obesity to do experiments. So you can create obesity in an animal. And when they did so, they noticed two things. Often the animals were ravenous, gluttons, but they got obese even when they didn't. Even when they didn't eat any more than lean animals, they got obese even if they ate half of what a lean animal eats. So basically you could semi-starve these obese animals and they would be obese anyway. Clearly, if you paid attention to that, whatever you did to make these animals obese was somehow independent of how much they ate. So it wasn't an eating disorder, it wasn't an eating, it was some kind of fat, you know, you made these animals want to accumulate fat and these people didn't pay attention. They just saw the gluttony and said, oh, we've confirmed that gluttony causes obesity. And whenever they had animals that got fat anyway, they said, well, we're not gonna pay attention to those because we don't know what to do with them. But in these other animals, gluttony is the cause. So from the very, from like the 1930s onward, you have this belief that obesity is an eating disorder. By the 1960s, psychologists and psychiatrists are studying obesity, trying to figure out how to get fat people to eat less. And they're describing it as like, you know, what, uh, you know, problems they had in their childhood or abuse they suffered might have caused them to want to eat too much. And they're not even studying fat accumulation anymore. So the point I make in my book is, you know, you've got this disorder of excess fat accumulation and the researchers are studying how much people want to eat and exercise, not how much fat they accumulate. Um, the worst examples of this when you read this literature first of all the way they talk about the way the researchers talk about their obese patients is so demean demeaning and you would never like they would be thrown out of science this would be new new york times articles about you know all these researchers who got thrown out for fat shaming their patients but even when they talked about phenomena like when women go through menopause they tend to gain weight. They tend to get fatter. This is a common phenomenon. And it's so common that you can, when animals go through the animal equivalent of menopause, or if you cause the animal equivalent of menopause in animals, they will get fatter. Okay. And it's clearly linked to estrogen secretion. So when estrogen goes down, fat accumulation goes up. It's been a well-known phenomena, you know, in, even in men, it's linked to testosterone secretion. So if you create a eunuch, if you castrate a man, he gets fatter, not because he ate more, but because he's secreting less, no testosterone and his body wants to accumulate fat. But you'd read these, the, 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 the most influential obesity researcher in the world in the 1930s, the one who convinced America, the world's physicians that obesity is an eating disorder and go, nah, you know what happens is those women, they're like past childbearing age, their kids are gone, they don't care what their husbands think anymore, they're sitting around playing bridge with their lady friends and eating too many bonbons. I mean, unbelievable. But this is the root of our theory that obesity is caused by taking in more energy than you expend, by over consuming food as opposed to being a hormonal disorder that makes people accumulate excess fat. 
So that's, that was the first mistake. And then from there, they just pile on top. You know, we, you decide dietary fat causes heart disease. And if we're going to blame everything on dietary fat, you've got to eat a low fat diet. So you replace the fat with carbs. So carbs have to be healthy. So if fat causes heart disease, carbs have to be heart healthy. And now we're telling people to eat carbohydrates and then high fructose corn syrup comes in and people don't even know it's sugar. And then corn refiners go out of their way to talk about it like it's some kind of healthy fruit sugar, not just a kind of liquid version of sugar. And so through the 80s, sugar consumption goes up, carb consumption goes up, fat consumption goes down. And basically we're putting the country on, if you want to design the most fattening diet, according to the biochemistry and the endocrinology, which is the science of hormones, it was pretty much what we told people to eat in the 1980s. And then especially if you're overweight or obese, you were told to eat that diet, just less of it, not so much that you get fat. So you're supposed to eat this fattening diet and starve yourself. And then when it fails, you blame the person who the diet failed on, not the one who gave the advice. It's crazy. You know, you explaining this, I've read almost all of your books and it, it sounds completely chaotic from your mouth. Like, you know, when you're reading it, you're kind of picking away at it and, and hearing this out loud. It's like, it's pure chaos. They have their eyes on the wrong prize. And it almost sounds like somebody's just writing crayons on a, on a wall. Like, why don't we just try this? This is fun. Like, no. Well, this I, is, you know, I, one of the weirdly embarrassing things about doing this for 20 years is I, I keep thinking about it all the time because I'm always thinking, how do I, how does a journalist, now a journalist with tens of thousands of allies in the medical community, but how does a journalist convince the scientific community they made a mistake? And, you know, I can name a dozen establishment researchers, really well-respected researchers who would now agree that sort of we're right and everyone else is wrong, which is good. That's a dozen more than would have agreed 20 years ago, but that's a dozen out of thousands. Um, so I keep thinking about new ways to do it. One of the great things about this new book is I got to interview all these very smart physicians who also, I don't know how I miss talking to you, by the way. Maybe it was the boat thing, you know? Um, Probably. <laughs> but I got to to talk to really smart people who have been thinking about it also. And I, there were, so there are ways of thinking about it, like that I just 18 years in suddenly struck me like, wait a minute, this whole idea that obesity is caused by eating too much. That's a thin person's way of thinking about it. It was interesting. I was kind of motivated by, I was thinking a lot about the at me too movement. Because one aspect of the Add Me Too movement is that my opinion as a man really doesn't matter that much because I cannot understand how you think about, you know, what, how a woman feels and understands sexual harassment in the workplace or anywhere. Because I am not, you know, I, I'm the wrong person to understand it. So I have my belief system, but it may not be relevant to what's really happening. In obesity, the only, the, the people studying it were doctors. They were tended to be men almost exclusively, although when they were women, they were better. And I could get into that. Um, and they were thin. And so they were thin and they knew that they ate in moderation and occasionally they exercised, this being the 1920s, 1930s, it wasn't that big of a deal exercising. And so they'd see a fat person and they'd assume that they're thin because what they see is that they're thin and eat in moderation. They see a fat person and somebody suffering from obesity and they assume that person does not eat in moderation. So they figure if those people did what they did, and we all think like that, like I think now if everybody carb restricted, they would be thin too, right? So I tell people to carb restrict. The difference is I used to be 40 pounds heavier. So I have some personal evidence that by carb restricting, I seem to have worked for me. Um, 
they didn't even have that. They didn't have an opportunity to be converted because because they're naturally thin. They never got to think, well, this advice doesn't work for me. So they could assume that for those people, it didn't work. They just did it wrong. So they end up with this idea. And the guy who promoted this, Lewis Newberg at the University of Michigan, was like razor thin when you look at his pictures. I mean, pencil thin, pick your metaphor. From their perspective, if somebody's fat, it's that they're not doing what they're doing, and if they're, which is eating in moderation. And the reason they know they eat in moderation is because they're not fat. And if they met someone, like one of my best friends in college, who was six foot five, 190 pounds, and could eat for hours, they would say, well, he doesn't really matter because there's a lot of human variation. So they always had a way to ignore any negative evidence. This is a sort of common phenomenon in bad science. So the, you end up with this idea that basically telling people that obesity is an energy balance disorder and telling them that the way to solve it is by eating less and exercising more, that's how thin people think. And the point out, and telling us we should eat fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, beans, you know, blah, 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 is that's because thin people eat like that naturally and they stay thin. So they assume if we all ate like that naturally, we would stay thin also. And the point is that when we eat like that, we don't stay thin. We get fat and hungry. Mm -hmm. If we try to eat like our thin friends do. So I wanted, I'm hoping my fantasy is this book will give us the right to say, look, don't tell me to eat like you do because I can't do it. Your body can metabolize those foods. My body can't. So you've got to respect that. I'll be jealous of you because you can eat pasta. But you have to respect the fact that I, my body can't metabolize those foods without storing, you know, excess fat and making me hungry. It's a thin person perspective. Maybe we could think of a hashtag. To, I haven't yet, but. Ooh, okay. I'll marinate on that. Yeah. I'm horrible with hashtags. So I'm probably no help with you for you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, you know, my wife could probably come up with it, but um, we'll see. Anyway, so that's the, um, sorry, I'm getting signaled by something on my computer. So I want to, of course, quit it. So don't and leave me alone to focus here. Deal. Horse quit. Okay, we're good. Awesome. And so do you feel like calories have a place? Like we've just you've just dropped a whole bunch of truth bombs here and there and everywhere. Um, so, you know, somebody might hear, okay, but like, I only have 1500 calories for the day. Does that matter? Does it, does it, is it more about the food choices and less about the calories? Can we go a little bit into the C word? Because I know the people listening right now are thinking, but what about okay. calories? So calories are a convenient way to measure how much food you're eating. And we could use grams or ounces or, um, so it's a measure of how much food you're eating, but it's not the deciding factor in whether or not you're storing calories as fat or not. So think of it as the, you're storing calories, that's a hormonal phenomenon. And that was worked out by the 1960s. And it's, the science has worked out pretty well. It's in biochemistry textbooks. It's all textbook medicine, basically. So. You secrete insulin, the hormone insulin, and insulin basically tells your fat tissue to hold on to fat. And as we talk in, I talk about in the book, fat tissue, fat cells are exquisitely sensitive to insulin. So when you're secreting insulin, you are storing fat. That's what the insulin is telling your fat to do. And you secrete insulin in response primarily to the carbohydrates in your diet. So eat a carb rich food, you know, starches or grains, but you know, bread, potatoes, pasta, sweets, drink Coca-Cola or fruit juice. You're secreting insulin. The insulin is saying, burn the carbs, store the fat. That's the key factor. So I talk about this. Yeah, there's a textbook of uh, obesity. It was 
published half a dozen years ago, which says every diet works by lowering the amount of calories you consume. That's a fundamental lesson. That's how diets work. And the point is, that's not how diet. diets work. Biologically, a diet will work if you get lower insulin sufficiently, independent of how many calories you're eating. And if you lower insulin, you'll mobilize fat from your fat cells and your body will burn that fat for fuel and you will not be hungry. So you're basically doing what you want to do, which is get fat out of your fat cells because it's stored to excess there. And you want to burn it for fuel. And the way you do that is lower insulin. The way you lower insulin is get rid of the carbohydrates, independent of calories to some extent. That's what you want. That's where you want to keep your eye when you're trying to fix these problems is not on how much you're eating, but on what you're eating because your hormonal response is to what you eat, not to how much. Um, the calories itself, like I said, I do know people and particularly older women who say, I still have to restrict the total amount of food I'm eating. So I still have to count calories to some extent. And that may be true. It's not true for many people. There, are, I know plenty of people, including myself, where I, could, I know I'm not going to gain weight regardless of how much I eat, as long as I don't eat carbs. Um, but for some people, apparently, they still have to count calories. But the, in experimenting with these diets, and I also show in this in the book, I have one section where I sh I want to talk about this. So I sh I have pictures of sort of fattening meals with carbs. So like a 600 calorie breakfast and a 600 calorie lunch and a 600 calorie dinner, one with carbs that's technically fattening to those of us who fatten easily and one without carbs that isn't, but the calories are the same. And you could look at these meals and say, I, I could eat either one of those would be filling for me would be enough for lunch, dinner. I wouldn't feel like I was overeating, but one would promote fat accumulation and one would, is basically part of a keto diet and the calories are the same. So I'm trying to get people away from thinking about calories. We've been brainwashed that it's all about calories, that it's all about how much we eat. And it's not, not biologically. Biologically, it's about what we eat, you know, whether the foods we eat stimulate insulin or they don't. And the, this is the other catch. The one that doesn't is fat. So you end up with these high fat diets that we've been taught, programmed, like dogmatically that this, these will kill us. And they won't, and they don't. They seem to make us healthier, so. Yes. And I remember when I was reading good calories, bad calories, I was like 30% through and I was like, oh man, I wonder what kind of criticism Gary gets on a daily basis. Like, what are people saying to this guy? Like some of the things you're sharing are so, well, a lot of the things we just talked about are really against the common narrative. Like, what is that like? Like, uh, has it changed? Is it better? Is it worse? I'd love to just know. <laughs> It's weird and it's different. So this started with, I mean, the very first New York Times Magazine story, which is, was the most infamous story they did of that decade. It came out in 2002, most controversial. So it just, cover headline was, what if fat doesn't make you fat? Inside headline was, what if it's all been a big fat lie? And the cover photo was a, porterhouse steak with a pat of butter on it. <clears throat> and the editor later told me that they had chosen a photo that was like the greasiest steak they could find. You know, they really want. So this came out and I was prepared for it to be the most controversial story they ran. And it still shocked me, the response. And I actually lost friends over because I had friends in the science writing community who thought of me as one of the best science writers in the world, but had also written books about obesity and had bought into the conventional wisdom. So now I came along saying the conventional wisdom is probably long and they accused me, one of them said I had had a brain transplant 
and just wrote what I wrote, made it up basically to get a book deal, which I did get. Um, so, and then the Washington Post went after me, uh, uh, Reporter and Reason Magazine went after me. Um, and the way you do it is you then call up the conventional wisdom scientists who say Taub's got it wrong. And then you just quote the people got it wrong. So I had to respond and say, well, of course they say I got it wrong because I'm saying maybe they got it wrong. So that's not the way to report this story. <laughs> <laughs> the report the story is to see who agrees with me, not who disagrees with me. So we've established the 98. Anyway, it was kind of shocking. Um, and then, you know, the book came out. It just, it's a kind of a constant theme. So the great thing is you get more and more allies. All these physicians become allies. It's a very vibrant now, low carbohydrate world. There are networks, email networks, conferences. Um, these low carb conferences where you can go and there's 800 physicians in the audience, all of whom want to learn more about this. Um, the other influencers in this space become friends and allies. So you become part of a movement, which is, you know, kind of rewarding. I like to joke that Don Quixote is my role model now. You know, you just go after that windmill and hope it doesn't you know, beat you up too bad when you ride by. I even had my, this is funny, my wife is a, a writer and a humorist and she has an Instagram account. Somebody left a, a comment on her Instagram account saying, you know, the, the poor woman is married to Gary Taubes. Imagine being married to that. And I said to my wife, boy, she didn't even say him. She said that. And my wife said, yeah, she's joking. It's about all your low carb telling you not to eat baked goods and all the things us women all love. But it's like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm not as charming as I used to think I was when I was younger. Anyway, the um, it's weird. I don't know if you know, I was I was on a debate with uh, on the Joe Rogan show with this young neuroscientist blogger who just thinks I'm wrong and kind of hates me. And it was conceivably the worst show Rogan ever did. And luckily, it was basically two and a half hours of this guy attacking me. And I, I expected us to have a discussion. He went out to win a debate. So it was just, and luckily afterwards, I, um, I wasn't going to look at social media. I came away thinking, boy, that was awful. And whatever happened, I certainly didn't handle it well. I didn't, you know, whether other people thought I lost, I didn't handle it well. I thought of myself as being able to do, you know, control the situation. It was completely out of my control. And luckily my wife the next day said, Gary, you have to look at the comments on YouTube. And I said, no, I can't. I swore I wouldn't. I'm not even going to look at Twitter for a year. And she said, no, you got to look. And I went to YouTube and hundreds and hundreds of people talking about how much they hated the show and hated this young blogger. <laughs> and these were Rogan's fans, not Taub's fans. So it was sort of like, oh, okay, I can live with this. You know, this was, but um, it's just, there are people out there who, no matter what you say, we'll always think of you as a quack and um, irresponsible. There are young research, a few websites, people linked to this one blogger who I was on Rogan with, who, you know, sort of go through the books, trying to point out every error in the book to prove that somehow, you know, good calories, bad calories. And no matter what you say to correct them, it never shows up in there so they it's it's weird it's an odd place to be in life where you're trying to explain to the research community how they got it wrong and then there's a whole subset of people who are trying to you know whack you in the head with the nearest hard object to explain how you got it wrong and not where i expected to be in life in my you know dawn of my doddering era
Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for continuing to do this work, even though people want to hit you over the head with a blunt object. So <laughs> that's, that's really great. And it's so necessary. And it's so great to have your books as a resource. So I, I, I just remember reading Good Calories, Bad Calories and just thinking, oh man, like he's got to receive something for this. And it's just, it's so, it's so great to have you, um, continue to pursue the truth. And um, thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for writing this newest book. And, and where can people find more from you um, on social media or your website? Or where can people get your book? Tell us all the things. Okay, so hopefully the book will be available everywhere. If your independent bookstore is open, buy it there. You don't mind leaving the house. Um, and if it's not open, Amazon, clearly, and Barnes and Noble. Um, Target is doing a special promotion on it. So you can buy it at Target and make them feel good about snapping up all these copies. Um, my website is at GaryTalbs.com. So people can reach me at GaryTalbs.com. I don't blog. I blog about once a year. It's a common phenomena. Um, and Twitter is Gary Taubes. So I guess it's, no, my website's just GaryTaubes.com. Twitter is at Gary Taubes. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I think people need to know how to think about this. So they know how to use even the kind of information you're giving them to put it in perspective. So they can have confidence that what they're doing if it's making them healthier in the short run, it's at least as beneficial as anything that their doctors might be telling them otherwise. And again, my fantasy is that everyone will buy a copy for themselves and then buy a copy to give to their physicians and beg their physicians to read and just say, look, just understand this. Stop being closed-minded. Just open the possibility that, that something you've been taught and chosen to believe was wrong. Actually, physicians often say that in med school, there's always a professor who says half of what they learn in medicine is wrong. The problem is we don't know which half. And this book will explain at least one part of that half and then how to fix it. So, thank you. Beautifully said. Thanks again for coming on the show. We appreciate the work that you're doing and I'll include links and everything um, in today's show notes. If you guys want to grab Gary's book, you can do so down below. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you, Leanne. It's been great. I'm glad we finally had a chance to meet. Whoa right? Am I right? Did you love that? I hope you did. I had such a fun time getting to speak with Gary Taubes. Uh, you can grab his book, The Case for Keto, just released a couple of days ago. So you can find that down below. And as always, if you have questions, concerns, comments, thoughts, ideas, head on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me. And as always, if you are new to the ketogenic diet and you need a little help, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash free to get a free guide on how to start the ketogenic diet. I will include links down below. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel, you could do that right there. Just click the little subscribe button and the little um, bell, and I will see you in a couple days for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. <laughs> Bye.